Hmm. Have y'all ever noticed that, uh, well, I'll, I'll start by saying there's a line in uh, the movie Men in Black where, uh, hell, I forget his name. The older guy says to the younger guy, people are dumb, panicky animals, and you know it. And they are. They're dumb, panicky, herd animals driven by almost a hive of mindset. And that constant buzzing of information that we have on our televisions is uh, tuned into that in the greatest way. But what it does is it creates for us a, a framework, a map, so to speak. People want to bitch about keeping up with the Joneses, but if you weren't doing that, what would you be doing? What list, litmus test would you have to determine whether or not you were successful in anything? Without the spirit of competition, how do you understand whether or not you're doing better or growing or succeeding? What measure would you use to determine or quantify the quality of your fucking existence on this planet? So you compete. Competition is a good thing. Being a winner is a good thing. Being a loser is a good thing. Both have opportunities for growth, although wildly divergent in their nature. They're both opportunities for growth. Excuse me. But what about faith? The roadmap that we talk about, and everyone talks about the road less traveled and all that shit. If you're on the road less traveled and you're by yourself, good. Good for you. Why in the fuck should I follow you? Why should I pay attention to anything that you're saying? Because you're following a road less traveled. Nobody else is going that way. Why do you want to go that way? Who do you think you are that you can go that way? I always say surround yourself with people that say, why not? Just like Kevin Smith says in his video on the meaning of life, YouTube. Be aware it's Freddie Vulgar. Surround yourself with why not people. Oh, you want to write a cookbook? Well, why not? Go for it. Oh, you want to take your own path? Well, go for it. Although I find that there's a limit to that. And it always tends to center around what happens after you die and faith in today's world. See, because we all subscribe to that same framework. We know how other people are going to react. We know beta males are going to be sneaky little bastards stabbing people in the back. We know alpha males are going to walk around and do whatever the fuck they want. Females are going to gravitate towards one until they figure out that the other one is the safer bet and will probably sustain you through the long term. <laughs> Figuring out which one you want to go with is a whole other story. But when it comes to matters of faith, and most of us or most people that will listen to this have decided to go their own path, and we see other people doing the same thing. Is it creating a body of substantive work that allows us to have clarity in moments of confusion? Just like reading a map. Are we laying the groundwork that will operate as a map for generations to follow? Or are we a bunch of dickheads standing around whistling in the dark to keep the boogeyman away, which is what I think Dave Martell is. Yeah, I almost think that I would give somebody an hour to draw a crowd and kiss their ass in public if that motherfucker doesn't heal up and confess before he dies. But be that as So when we're in this realm of exploration and high adventure and new horizons that I'm so fond of talking about, following a true nautical standard, as I've mentioned in the past, are we creating a map others can follow and giving to them a framework by which they might measure the success of their lives? 
or are we simply doing something because we wish to be more right than the next person? And we have caught on to various rabbit holes and ideas and conversations that we want to be more right. And there's a valid reason for what we're doing. And it's legitimate and I have every right to do it. Blah, 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 blah. Because we might know all kinds of things. We might be aware of all manner of injustices, of conspiracies, of wrongs done to the human race as a whole. <laughs> Political, societal, racial injustices across the board. <laughs> Is that where we need to be stuck? So what we're doing is creating a map for later generations to follow that leads them to this point and no further. Oh. My man. How you doing, bub? Good, man. Sorry I'm late. It's all right. I was recording an excellent soliloquy on creating a map future generations might follow. Because <laughs> that's what we're doing. And I find, pro I find a little problem with it. How's your week been? Oh, it's been good, man. Uh, working like crazy because I'm going to be going to California in January for a few weeks. So I've just been trying to stack the money. And then... Mm -hmm. uh, you was great. Good. Mm -hmm. I heard it was a good time. Yeah, it was good. Good. I, uh, I've been thinking, and I kind of, I think I may have come across. Oh, see, I, I, okay. I just got your text. <laughs> <laughs> I found you in my emails. I was trying to hurry up and get on. It's all right, man. No, I've been, I found a, I found, I've been toying with a couple of ideas. People being a herd animal, but also being possessed of a hive mind. Yeah. At the same time. It's kind of an interesting, interesting idea, but I see, I'm just turned on this show and I'm watching it and I'm like, holy shit, there's, there's, there's evidence of it all across the animal world and the insect world. But I got a book about writing because one of these days I'd like to write a really good book. And uh, it's called Maps of the Imagination. And then there's uh, all kinds of books, but it's Maps of Imagination, the writer as cartographer. And it has stuck in my head like few things have in a long time. And I know I've danced around the edges of it as, you know, books talking about a true nautical standard and the North Star and being guided by, you know, a certain set of principles. But I'm looking at it more and more and I see that, that we're not really charting new ground for future generations to follow because we're unsure of the map that we've received with regards to our spirituality, our thinking process, our emotional states of being, so on and so forth. And we try to find it through academia, but it falls so short of offering us that insight into uh, where we need to be headed that I find much of it, I'm, I'm almost dismissive of a lot of it. And I get an email every, every two or three of them a day of the latest PDF or peer-reviewed document on academia, EDU, about whatever Norse idea somebody's talking about. One of them today was, one of them was about Odin as a homosexual, and one of them was the stone, secondary uses of stones, and just all kinds of horse shit. And um, it's... Uh, it's great that they can pull together various sources and just justify their opinion, albeit a wrong one or incorrect assumption or not even a workable theory. But my, my real problem is with that as I'm reading this book is that we're not charting those, those waters that we need yet to sail with regards to creating a standard 
a litmus test, if you will, how future generations will determine the quality of their faith and the success of their lives based on the groundbreaking work we are in charge of doing right now as Gokies. Where is that body of work originating? And there was some effort to it years ago, but the, the Theodish and what's your source? Give me your source material. And I'm just like, you know, then it's unverified personal gnosis. Well, if there are a dozen people that are doing it and it works, then it's not unverified personal gnosis anymore. Now it's a, it's a plan that works. So I'm writing, I'm writing again about that. And I think it's going to be very fucking good. Probably more deeper than most people want to try to, to, to attempt to digest. But I think I can write it in such a way that it will entertain but I mean, the hell, I just opened it up and said, without our false starts, we'd have gotten nowhere at all. I mean, all of that's for everything that we've done has been important on this journey. I mean, how many fucking sailors died of fucking scurvy, you know, trying to fly <laughs> to the West Indies or can't get gold from the new world or lumber or whatever. It's interesting stuff. It's caught my imagination. So where, where are you at in your Gothi program, man? I won't start until summertime. That's when it starts. Oh, that's right. It starts at midsummer, doesn't it? Yeah. So, have you started any of the readings? Yeah. Well, I have a list of them. I haven't read any of the books yet. I need to though. And I have a uh, some of them I've already I think read. I looked at the list once or twice. I have a pretty extensive library, so I think there was a, a list of a few that I had already read. But I want to try to just if it's on there, I'm going to reread it, kind of freshen up on it. Ideally, though, before midsummer, I want to have most of those books done so that I have a head start on it. Uh, I led my first uh, big blow, uh, Yule, uh, to Odin. And uh, I've heard very good things about it. Man, I mean, I keep talking about <laughs> it. It blew, it blew me away because I like I've seen other people contact like the divine. But I don't feel like I didn't think that I, I thought I could do it. And I've had pretty good blows, but I never felt like I could have that kind of energy. Uh -huh. And it was almost like I was on autopilot at some point. It was so weird. Like I had orchestrated it and it felt like something was guided through me. Like I I was over here galdering like these epic galders and stuff. Like I had never done anything like that before. So I felt like this. It was like a, a reciprocal relationship with the gods, like almost like a, we were like a, touching each other almost uh, like the, our hands like like it was weird yeah like the, the energy from the circle they have uh pictures afterwards of like when i invited the ancestors into the circle there was orbs everywhere yeah like, yeah it's crazy <clears throat> so i need to uh work on i guess my spirituality is uh the, the right word to use uh to try to broaden that connect now that i know it's possible i feel like i can i can do better and so I don't know if better is the right word, but I can heighten that energy. I feel like I can. I think, I think that's probably a, a very valid insight. I think it's, it's probably, it's probably one of the most crucial things you'll do. I, I would suspect is, is the, is the deepening of your ability to make that connection. There was an exercise that I used to practice in meditation, and that is to reach out and feel your hands. And it's a very unique kind of, experience when you begin to understand that who you really are is not the accumulation of all your thoughts it is actually that animating energy behind those thoughts and when you can perceive it like that and then you have the ability to reach out and touch your hands now you have that toehold to broaden deepen and strengthen that connection to the spiritual realm that you got just a taste of leading that bloat so there's a real a real powerful uh, it's a real powerful lesson. I'm glad you got to experience it because that's that's where you that's where you're going to find answers to questions that you don't know. And I don't know how else to put it. That's where somebody will say something and something will come out of you and you have no fucking idea where it came from. I read these goddamn books that I've written and I'm like, what the fuck? I don't remember saying that. You know, but there it is. That is, uh, and it touches on, and for many people, they won't ever understand it. 
but it touches upon that that um, the very real aspect of a powerful spirituality. And when you think about it, and just what you were talking about, I mean, imagine imagine what you could accomplish if you could focus that for the betterment of your life and to bring those around you along, not following you, but alongside you, and perhaps even to push in front of, to encourage success, to engender support and, 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 and uh, success. That's a, that's a real powerful thing. I remember I had a conversation with Steve McNallan many years ago, and he said, uh, fuck, I sound like an old dick when I say that. He, he said, uh, we were talking about such grand ideas, and he, and he, said, uh, he said, you know, the Renaissance can be attributed to about 13 or 16 people. And I, I never bothered to look up whether or not it was true, but I immediately subscribed to the romance of that idea. Because I, I do love those fucking grand romantic ideas. Fucking wow. Yes. You know, somebody said something, somebody did something, somebody set an example so powerful, almost like the ones we read about in our lore, that it it affected other people. There's a there's a there's a fish called a uh, flashlight fish off the Solomon Islands. I just saw it on TV and it blew my fucking mind. And if one person, one fish flashes, they don't fucking do shit, or two or three. But if like five or 10 of them all flash in one direction, every one of them swinging dicks goes that way. And, this, and so when you think about people being the herd hive mentality and you get enough of us making powerful spiritual suggestions, could we not change the course of the herd? Now all of a sudden, when you when you begin to realize what you've just tapped into the very powerful spiritual energy you've tapped into such real such ideas to begin to develop a flavor of reality and therein lies the real strength of of what we're trying to do and it's and, and if you notice it didn't some people will never grasp that mike some people will never feel that. Some people will go through the fucking motions damn near their entire lives and never touch base with that because they'll get stuck like that, like that, like that page that I wrote that I sent you all about from the Theosophy Trust about Yggdrasil as the sap rises through the tree and everything we do, we move up the tree or we move down the tree based on our actions. We're moving up, we're moving down. We're kind of, hopefully the cumulative effort is that we're moving up. But some people get stuck in one spot and they form a big knot a burrow on a tree we see them in the forest they're stuck there people are stuck on the tree of life in the exact same manner and they form this great burrow this big knot and all nutrients that are supposed to pass through it to nourish the leaves in future generations stops right there with them and so when we begin to consider that we're a conduit for much of this kind of spiritual energy and the examples that we that we can talk about and sometimes emulate and sometimes not emulate it becomes a, a much more powerful responsibility but it seems at the same time that once we get a grasp of that the absolute weight of it is no longer a burden at least for me that's the way it feels it becomes a, a source of strength I don't know how, to, how else to explain it. You know, there was, um, there was one night, did I ever tell you about the farm? Um, I don't know. Let's, let's, hear, let's hear it and then. So one night we were laying in bed, me and Stephanie and Scarlett. And Scarlett was a baby, maybe two or three. <coughs> farm, the farmhouse was 5,000 square foot home with a fucking racquetball court in it and its own natural gas. It was a fucking huge place. I was trying, this one I wrote Austria Book of Days. And I've always, Matt always makes fun of me for preaching the gay out of a man. He saw me do it. He still makes fun of me about it. But so that's one miracle. So the other one was, I was writing Book of Days and I was knee deep in research and finding stuff that I could use and how to relate it. And much of it, much of it, if you pay attention to it, is, is dealing with a lot of it can help you deal with recovery. 
<clears throat> or just simply living a straightforward, honest life. But Stephanie was laying in bed and I heard her scream. And it was a muffled scream. She was in her sleep, screamed out. And it scared me. And usually when it, it was so bad when the boys were growing up, they would stand at the door to the room to wake me up because I would stand up ready to fight. You know, yeah. seven years in the fucking infantry, and I'm sure you got the same situation. If something bothers you, you you're ready to roll. Well, especially you get woke up in the middle of the night. It's just... Right. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You back up and regroup because I'm coming up swinging. Yeah. So I realized when she did that, I went to stand up, and Mike, I couldn't stand up. The covers weighed a fucking ton. I could barely get, took everything I had to get the fucking blankets off me so I could stand up. And when I stood up, I realized that all of the ambient light was gone from the room and that there were shapes in this room and they were going towards Stephanie. And when I stood up, they came to me. And I knew that if I opened my mouth, I would scream and cry like a woman. And I had two choices in that situation. And I don't know why I made the choice that I did, but I called on Odin. That's all I could do. I didn't fall to my knees and beg for Jesus. So this is, I'm still fairly new. This is four or five years in. I called on Odin and pushed away with everything I had. I don't know how to explain it, but Stephanie said that it looked like Samson pulling down the, uh, the columns. And I pushed, I don't know, I pushed outward with whatever was inside me and chased him away, got Stephanie, and I said, where's Scarlet? Grab Scarlet, and I walked down the hall. It was a lengthy hallway, and I, could, I couldn't catch my fucking breath. I was just, the hair was standing up on my arm, and her daughter came from the other side of the house, and she had a broken watch. The alarm started going off on it, and I called Steve McNall, and I'm like, Steve, I don't know what the fuck just happened, man. What do I fucking do? He said, light a candle, call on him, dog, go to these fucking rooms. So I went to fucking work, buddy. Because <laughs> I was scared to death. And that call to Steve, fuck his middle of the night. And uh, it took me a good five minutes before I was able to before I was able to open my mouth and speak a word without it coming out like some babbling insanity or a fucking scream. So so there was that was like my very first real powerful introduction into the reality of being able to tap in what you tapped into in that bloat for other reasons, because here's the deal. And I don't know the other way to put this. I'm going to give you another story to substantiate this, this thing. As we begin to maneuver within this new realm of spirituality, we accumulate, and I hate to use the word authority, but we do accumulate some kind of authority. <clears throat> power, if you will. So I have a good friend, and I'm not going to name her on here, but I, she's a very dear friend of mine and has been a close ally, and I've supported her in much of what she's done. She's very young, um, and she's Hellenistic. She follows the Greek gods. So occasionally her and I discuss these high-minded principles of Greek and also true, and we come across recurring themes of human growth and development of spirituality within them. And we discuss them and occasionally we'll do a video together. But she called in tears. Same thing happened to her. The week before we'd been talking about, she was making incredible strides in her development, in her growth, in her spirituality. She was thoroughly happy. And I suggested to her, I said, what you have to be aware of is as you move forward in this, there are just as many powerful elements that wish us never to achieve such a profound spiritual connection and move up the tree. And she got to encounter it as well. And in her case, she lit a candle and called on Hecate, the goddess or the Titan that guides souls through the underworld. And, and she found her, but she was, she slept with the lights on for a while. She had a very similar incident. I asked another old heathen 
um, she'd been around. She, she, so when I was a folk builder in what, 2012 and 13, uh, I took over from Greg Tharp. Greg Tharp took over from Mark Stenson. Mark Stenson took over for uh, um, Andrea Groom. So we're talking decades back. Andrea is a very hardcore, very focused human, good woman, solid woman. She's had the same kind of experiences. So when we're dealing with individuals that want to attribute their emotional state to certain negative events, the first thing we have to correct is their thinking process. And the whole time we're doing that, we're paying attention to what other forces might be around here mitigating the ability to gather that thought process solidly. Because I assure you it's there. It's like this underpinning of spirituality that as we break out of this cage, there's always something wanting to keep us in that cage. There's always a fucking jailer. And that jailer's there for a reason. They feed on that negative energy. Think of all of the negative energy that's released when people are marching in the street and raising hell and just bad and burning shit. All that anger and hate and frustration was just being just exudes from people. It's like when you walk into a room after two people have been in a fight, you can fucking feel it. Sure. So when you have 10,000 people in the street doing that, what's, where's that energy going? What's that sustaining? If we can sit here and submit that our bloat, that our ceremonial aspects are empowering the divine and sharing with us a gift for a gift, is not the reverse also true? So when we land as a Gothi on our feet with a body of knowledge and a, and a map for future generations, Scylla and Charybdis are obviously things that we have to be aware of because they do exist. They are a challenge. They are an impediment to our ability to return home as Ulysses found out. It gets deep. I like it. I like it. Yeah, sometimes I get quiet. It's not like I'm not listening. I just, I like to, sometimes it's better not to talk and to try to. I run out of things to say. I'm, that was my, that was my, that, that was me going esoteric. And I don't do it very often because it's, because it is so wild. But, you know, I had my friend Donna, she always said, take the mask off, take the mask off of the energy and see what you're dealing with. And it took me forever to understand what she was talking about. What the fuck do you mean, Donna? <clears throat> but I'm beginning to unfold that. Donna, Donna's almost my age. No, she's not. She's young and beautiful. She's probably 29 forever. But in the 90s, she was in her 20s. And she, she knows personally Ingona and Freya Aswin and all of these other elder heathens. And she was a young girl then. Now she's a powerful individual in her own right she amazes me in that all things seem to go her way she it always works out for her because she believes that it will and it fucking amazes me fucking amazing drives me crazy because for me i gotta have it laid out it's just yeah. gotta be organized gotta have it laid out she could give a fuck less where it is she has an idea she runs with it and there it is what are you shitting me Love her to death. Yeah. It's just the way she is, though. But the esoteric idea is that, that, that people always want to talk about when they approach you with those, you have to be very careful with it because much of the time when they're wanting to discuss esoteric ideas, they're wanting to find a way where they don't have to pay attention to you. And that's that's the real that's it's it's the flip version of the academic idea that well you don't have the right source material so I don't have to pay attention to you when you delve into the esoteric um, there's a whole world of people out there that know a lot of things they won't talk about and they um, I'm sure you've seen them <laughs> you got to experience one last weekend. Yeah, but that was like uh, the first time I think I, I I thought I had that. See, that's the thing, right? Is a uh, there's different stages to a pyramid, I think, right? Uh, that's a, that might be a weird analogy, but it's like you think you've seen 
a connection or felt the connection and then you feel something that you've never felt before and then it just like like literally I had like a sit home the next day when I got home and decompressed which usually these events take a few times to, um, a day to unpack yeah. Yeah. but I started sitting here and uh and thinking about it and uh it was like a whole other horizon you'd seen when you didn't know it could exist and then like I'm getting phone calls all week about uh the energy like the people left there and like a bunch of people joined afterwards and i got private messages from people saying that that experience uh prompted them to it's like life-changing and I, I can't believe that something so simple had an effect on other people like that and it's just even more, more harder for me to unpack but it excites me in like this extreme way because now i know that if that was my first one that the potential for like great things is like way there's probably other other horizons that i haven't even saw if i if i didn't know that it could exist like what else is out there right so it's like now i just want to set the ship in motion and sell off and see what i can figure out that, that's 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 exactly the way to do it too for myself i had to one of the things that was most important for me to be able to do that um was was uh taking an honest look at my success, yeah. taking an honest look at my failures, and then being willing to set those aside as those are not the things that define who I am because I am so much more than that. And, and it, um, it's a real, that's, that's a real process of growth um, because to tap into those greater reservoirs and those, and, and, map out the way to those new horizons, which I'm so fond of talking about. Um, it does require us to become different individuals. You will be, you will be an entirely different man. Hell, every six months, every cell in your body is different, is a new cell. Um, the only reason we maintain this semblance of who we are is because we carry so much fucking bullshit with us. <laughs> And when we start letting that go, who we become starts to become a, a much more different, much more powerful thing. And hopefully a much more inspiring thing for other people to see. Um, you've been through the ringer in life. Now look at you. Holy shit. Something just opened up in your world that by all rights, just, just on the fucking rates of recidivism alone, you should never have been able to experience, and yet here you are. And when you have gratitude for those kinds of things, setting that shit aside that we carry around is what it makes us who we are yeah. and allows us to become something new, that gratitude is so fucking important, Mike. It's just so important to, to, to be able to set some of that shit free. Fuck yes. And, and you know, that's just where it's at. I, uh, I've just been doing a lot of thinking. That's all I can say. Like a lot. <laughs> I'm sure you have. <laughs> I'm sure you have. <laughs> I'd, be, I'd be lying if I told you like I had this profound answer for any of it. I've just been like, I don't know. You, you get, it's a, uh, and like, I know though the book was what it was. Uh, it might've been different, powerful for different people, but I personally felt the connection with the divine. Like I felt like it worked and that's what I knew. I, I can't, you know, you probably, it's just different. It's uh, It's not like before. I've done, I've done books before mm -hmm. and I've done them in, in groups with people uh, that were bigger than that. Uh, but the energy there that night, like it was like a combination lock, whatever it was, it opened something. And uh, yeah, I don't know. So I'm, I'm enthralled by it, but now I know like I have to do a lot more discipline for me to get where I need to. It's, so this is going to sound really crazy. But ever since then, I've been having this weird experience. Now, I'm definitely not mentally ill and I'm not schizophrenic and I'm not hearing voices, but I feel like I'm in contact with like uh, something else, but without words. Does that make sense? Yes. Yeah. So I'm like communicating with this thing and I'm like getting responses, but there's no words exchanged. But I can tell that they're, they're deities of some some aspect or deities is the only term I use because I can't. But it's almost like I would use a different term, but I can't quite grasp what it is. I don't know if any of that makes any sense. Yeah, a lot of people say it's your ancestors. Yeah. A lot of people say focus on your ancestors. Um, that will help. 
clarify some of that. Um, and be aware also that as you as you're paying attention to those voices, um, be aware that not all of them are always friendly. I, I just right. why need to say that, but I've seen I've heard that many times. Um, they're not all out there for your for your well being, but there is also. Yeah, that's just a good place to be in, man. I, you know, if it was me and I was in those shoes again, I think I would I would celebrate it with gratitude in just every way possible. You know, that that kind of positive emotion sorts the wheat from the chaff, so to speak, with regards to positive and negative energies and gratitude for for making that connection, for feeling it. I mean, you finally have that solid justification that yes, I am on the right path. This is the thing that works. This is fuck. Here it is, man. I just, I, I did it. And now all of a sudden there's this main line of, 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 of connection and spiritual input and be grateful for it. And then yeah. celebrate it, you know, make an offering. I mean, just, you know, you make it pour a little bit out on the ground for the gods, you know, do what you need to do in those small moments to maintain that connection. Stop asking for things and start being grateful. Sure. And then, and then cultivate those gifts that we already have. There's the, there's the real secret. I, I know, you know, and you, you know that if you've experienced it, when you see the people talking about, well, I saw a crow or I saw two deer or I saw two dogs fucking, you know, there's just, you know, there was just, <laughs> and, you know, it's just. Well, sometimes, yeah, sometimes it might be spiritual and sometimes it might just be two dogs fucking. <laughs> right, exactly right. <laughs> yeah. And then, so you'll begin to see some of that. But those are the kind of people that are looking for that. They're, they're, they're living a life of expected phenomena, waiting on someone to show them or guide them or help them to experience what you and I have experienced at various times in our life. Yeah. How do we put that into the words that's most conducive to that process? <clears throat> a lot of times like beating your head against the wall. I'm just going to tell you, I'm just, it just is. Just, you know, the, the, the one thing too is a, that's a good, a great point. Uh, the profound aspect of asking for something to, cause I've asked a million times. I don't ask for a lot like ever, but to make connection to the divine, I have asked over and over in a roundabout way. Um, and uh, I think what made this one different, it wasn't us asking, like we crafted this sun wheel uh, as a group, they did it. And uh, the energy, it wasn't it wasn't so much of us uh, uh, asking them to come here. We went and knocked on the door persistently until it opened up is what I felt like. It was almost like we just walked in the house and was like, hey, <laughs> we'd like to. <laughs> You know, that's what King Gilfie did. Yeah. <laughs> and he didn't come by a straight way either. Yeah. So, so it seems like that map might, might, might be working. <laughs> yeah. Because <laughs> this is what it says. It says real clear. He, did, he came by the way of the snake. He came a crooked path. Yeah. So, okay. Well, now you're here. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, and I mean, not in a rude way either. Like, it wasn't like, a, I don't know. It's, you know, like, it, it, you don't have to... Uh, be gifted the experience you can go out and seize it like that's it yeah i think being bold is an important thing in life anyway yeah our, our guys i think definitely uh, respect boldness more than meekness that's the difference between yeah. us and christian well yeah it's embracing the life that you've given it's embracing yeah it's fucking it's a good deal yeah um, and, and you, you can see that in people's character whether they're fighter like physical strength or mental strength i've seen uh people facing certain death from illness and been bolder than any man in battle i've ever been next to so oh. like i think being bold is just a profound you know goes beyond all that yeah my grandpa my grandpa proved that when he was dying and uh, just he he just he told him he's not going to try to get into heaven on a line they asked him if he wanted to preach here and he said no i don't think i do just gonna go like I am, and I thought, "Wow, fucking balls!" You know. Yeah. Then he he beat life into his own what he wanted. I'll tell you that much. He wasn't no joke. Neither one of them were really. Well, I feel like that's a a genuine man right there. That's well, gonna be the the moment where we're at our weakest, right? And uh, he was stronger than most. That's it. 
an admirable trait. I always thought so too. It's just, uh, yeah, but he was just that way. He was extremely intelligent. He he just could not stand organized religion at all. He was absolutely a sun worshiper. <laughs> He said, if there's anything that powers everything that goes on on this planet right now, it's that sun right up there in the sky. Everything else is bullshit. And so he, he went that way too. He had no idea what's coming next. And he just said, fuck it, I'm going to go like this. I'm not going to tell anybody everything I've done wrong. I know what it is. And yeah, I think that's a ploy anyway, right? Like there is a certain solace in being able to confide in somebody and work through issues. Mm -hmm. But I think that there's a potential for abuse and disingenuine, uh, you know, a lot of the Catholicism, it was more of like a power tool. Because if you know, like you said, I think you said this on one of the chats, if you know everything about everyone in your community, how powerful is that, right? It's a position of power, but now it's on you to abuse it or to use it righteously. Well, unfortunately, we know that the... Uh, the typical human nature is we abuse it, right? So shit, the track record of humanity, you can look well. <laughs> hell, I get it. I got an email the other day. I'm not even Catholic. I got an email about 1,400 priests are being protected by the Vatican that have abused children. And I'm like, oh man. And they're a city state. They could be throwing them off the building there and the world couldn't do shit about it. Yeah, I mean, exactly. <laughs> yeah, it's that, is, that is that is incredible, isn't it? They're a city state. Yeah, and you know, you know what, what else too is the amount of knowledge they have in the Vatican. Like, and people ask me, they're like, "Well, what would one thing that if you could do anything in the world?" And that'd be on the top of the list is to scroll those books and see what kind of hidden knowledge that they have because they're they're smart enough not to destroy knowledge, right? But they they also uh, they want to keep it hidden so that it doesn't disrupt the normality of what they have constructed. But there's probably spiritual books in there that could change the whole world. And uh, well, I'm sure of it. And they keep them on lock and key. When Alexander burned, you better believe they raided it first. Like, I'm sure the most important books are sitting in that Vatican right now, or at least copies of it. The thing about the burning of Alexandria, when the church burnt the city of Alexandria, or the library of Alexandria, the library of Alexandria contained an enormous amount of knowledge. And the problem with knowledge is, is that it did not empower the church. So anything that didn't put the church first, the church as the intercessor between man and God, it was, it was, uh, it was, what is that word? Fuck, uh, 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 it begins with an A. Anyway, it was poo-pooed in an official Catholic term. But there are, you know, there are two books missing out of the prosetta or the poetic edda. Two books are missing out of that. And there's a couple of other books that are referenced that we don't know what they are. And I've often wondered, now, the contents of the Vatican Library are digitized now. You can look through the Vatican Library. Trouble is, it's all in Latin. So you'd have to have a crash course in Latin just to understand what you're looking at. A lot of it is, there's a lot of good stuff in there. But hell, it's not like it's not there. What was it? A couple of years ago, they uncovered a, uh, a more extensive tome of European folklore than the Brothers Grimm had compiled. It's like 184 folk tales from, from uh, Europe and some of it pre-Christian in origin. And there's, a, there's an enormous amount of our mythologies and lore and spirituality contained in those, contained in those, uh, in those tales. I don't know if they've been translated to English yet, though. I know they're in German, but there's a bunch of them. So there's still a lot to learn. Sure. That's what we need scholars, because... Uh... Yeah, we do. Yeah. That's why, that's why we need them, those two books wherever they may be, who knows? And the Bishop of, uh, what was it, Sweden? Gave them to the King of Denmark. I think now they're in Iceland. But they are you know, a they, they have a, they have them digitized, but I would imagine that there's some things that are probably not digitized that they keep under lock and key. Probably. 
I don't but know, I mean, given, the, given the nature of the Catholic Church today, who knows if anyone's even paying attention to it? They're right. they're, they're they have a billion, one point four billion Catholics practicing Catholics in the world, and right. every day them fuckers are giving ten every Sunday. They're throwing ten dollars in the plate. So, yeah. Um, well, that's why they love South America, man. Because you can say, I always tell people this too. Uh, Catholicism in South America, like those people, well, in some parts of Europe too. But like you're talking devout, devout. Like you go to Spain, uh, and that's why South America is so devout because the Spanish and uh, the Italians and the, uh, the Portuguese, like those people, are so Catholic that they like almost forget that there was anything before that. Well, fuck, man. That's where the uh, Spanish Inquisition was. Yeah, I mean, yeah. rooted out because there was a rebellion against the Catholic Church, and the, I forgot the name of the war, Armand War, or something like that. But it was the foundations of the beginning of the Inquisition. And then when they came to South America, you know, they were still doing human sacrifices on the top of those pyramids. Yeah, and these priests come in and say, "Oh no, you don't have to do that anymore. Our God sacrificed Himself for you." Well, fuck yeah, I'd like to keep my kids. Yeah, so, you know, it was a quick, easy sell. Except, yeah. you know what? We're going to keep this Day of the Dead thing. You don't mind? Well, no, by all means, go right ahead. Just put your ten dollars in the plate. Yeah, but you know, oh, the amount of money is just staggering. Yeah, it's insane. That's the real treasure. Is what fucking? There's no telling what how much gold and bullshit they pillaged from South America is in that fucking in those in those treasuries. And did you see what happened uh, recently? I think I have a picture of it on my phone. I'm going to try to pull it up. Uh, so the Pope uh, released, um, he released uh, a, a, his little dove out and a, a crow. Yeah. You saw that, it? That happened, that happened a couple of years ago. Yeah. He really, oh, okay. Yeah. I thought I just saw it right now. And I was like, that is amazing, man. Like, if that's not a sign the gods are waking up. I don't know what it is, man. <laughs> Man, yeah, I thought that was new, but still, that's a good point. The signs that the gods are the waking up, the the rabid conservative ideas that are that are so di diametrically opposed to cancel culture. Um, that's another aspect of the spirituality's ebb and flow across the across peoples. Uh, liberals would would absolutely deny change or so radically alter the things that are coming out that we wouldn't even be able to recognize them and change them or cancel them or whatever. Yeah. But that's, that's also a part of the, the force of spirituality across societies. Um, Young mentioned it when he wrote his um, famous deal on Odin before World War II, where groups of young people were wandering Germany, um, inspired by the spirit of Odin himself. That was um he, I need to find that and post that because that's a really good that's a really good thing to read. If you haven't read it, you should. That was Carl Jung speaking about the influence of Odin on pre-war German youths, and it's profound. And of course, it led to a berserk frenzy. That I don't know. I think eighty-four million people uh, total were killed in that in the World War II. The most. More people died on that war than any war in history, ever. Dramatic. And mostly Europeans. Uh, well, we say that, but that's 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 our perception on it. But if you look at what Japan did across Southeast Asia, oh, that's true. That, yeah, man, no one ever thinks about that. That's millions, millions of Chinese and Koreans and Filipinos and all the way to India were just decimated. And then after that, the great re-education with Mao Zedong, and there's another 100 million Chinese that didn't want to be communists that just ended up in a ditch. Yeah. Um, holy fuck. You know, <clears throat> I did see the other day that for the first time in a long time, human population has stopped expanding now i think they're trying to blame the virus but i don't think there's enough deaths to do that you have 7.4 billion people on this planet i think we have enough people 
Yeah. They say it at they say at 10.5, the planet will no longer be, be able to sustain the human population. We just it can't produce enough to feed all those mouths. And if the Beaufort Gyre breaks free in the North Atlantic and floods the floods the Gulf Stream, the Gulf of Mexico, the Gulf Stream that keeps London warm with cold water and causes it to sink. Um, London, your, most of Northern Europe will not be able to grow enough food to feed its population. Because you got to remember, London is the same latitude as Moscow. And the only reason it's warm in that part of Europe is because of the Gulf of Mexico and that Gulf Stream that goes around Florida and goes all the way up and goes across. That's why they have that London fog. It's the size of 300 Amazon rivers and it's warm ocean water. And it keeps it warm there. If that's interfered with, which is looking more and more possible, uh, Europe's going to be a cold motherfucker. Like it may have been before, right? Like it has or been many times. Yeah. Like it has been many times. But that neither here nor there. Ain't much we can do about it. Right. Dude, I'm going to get off here, man. Yep. I right, appreciate you, man. I'll try to be on on time on Sunday. I, I've, I've, uh, can't really make excuses just trying to do a million <laughs> things at once, you know? So I try to get here as soon as I can. It'd be all right, man. I appreciate you coming on. I appreciate you, buddy. You have a good night. All right. We'll talk to you. Bye. All right. Bye.